now. Picked up at this time. We have um, a lot of people gone today. <clears throat> but what we have here, just marvelous people, don't you think so? Wonderful people, don't you think so? People that love to pay attention, don't you agree? Should I continue? My phone rang not that many months ago, and I've uh, been planning on talking about this, and uh, the caller on the other side had something against what we believed, or I said what I believe, I can't press my beliefs on you, and uh, had a, a question to ask, and uh, this is the question, I'll give it to the conversation in just a second, but it's a good question. I mean, if someone's gonna profess to know something or to teach something, or a, what they view as a correct way in Scripture, it would behoove them to have studied what the Word of God has to say. Not only that, but what's really doubly interesting to me is that if you're going to say something, you ought to be able to defend it because the truth has nothing to fear, as I often say. So the person asked me this question. What if a sincere believing person is on his way to be baptized and dies right before he gets to the water. Are you telling me that God would send that person to hell just because he did not make it to the water? Now, on the outset, this looks like a, a phenomenal question, one that's just going to stump everybody. But whenever we tear this apart, and I want to do this lovingly, whenever we look at the question, uh, I want you to notice he's already, the person calling, he had already resolved in his mind that this is me making a statement and not the Word of God, or me making a statement and not a biblical principle. Because he says, are you telling me that God, okay? Now, whenever that arises, we know, number one, and the person wasn't upset, and I wasn't upset talking with the person, don't even want to begin to even, uh, even get you to even think that for just a second. But what's interesting is that the God would do that argument can be used against almost any commandment in the Bible. What sounds good at the outset, and people want to come up with all kinds of, of theoretical cases, hypothetical cases, to try to dissuade other people away from what the Bible has to say. I can come up with all kinds of things. Let me give you an example of that. I'm not going to get a lot of examples. But I'm a firm believer in Matthew 19 and verse 9. One husband and one wife for life. I believe that's what God designed. I believe the only scriptural reason for remarriage, the only scriptural reason for somebody else to have another wife is through adultery or through death. I believe that. I believe it's the absolute only safe way. And yet, having said that, I know there are going to be things you bring up and can bring up to me I can't possibly answer. Whether I can answer them or not does not go to the idea of what the truth is. I'm not infallible. God is. Now, when you look at these things, you're going to say, well, now, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Let's just get to a biblical principle here. And, you know, everyone I've ever met, that has had a, 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 I'll just get to the marriage issue again, had a marital problem, a marital difficulty, agrees with me 100% of the time that the only absolute, positively sure way is by the two things I just said. And now there are other things that they may bring up, but anyway, be that as it may, I'll get off that onto this. I'll get onto that another time. Now that I've opened my mouth, here we go. The Word of God, you know, what does it have to say? Well, watch this. For example, the Bible repeatedly says that a person must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 8 and verse 24, Jesus even says this. He says, unless you believe that I am He, ye shall die, word there thanatos, be separated from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die, be separated in your sins. I didn't make that up. I didn't say that. I've got a question for you. What if 
Suppose then that a, a Christian had just begun to tell the story of Jesus to an older gentleman when suddenly that gentleman, that lady, that whatever age it might be, passes away. What happens in that situation? Now this is interesting to me because when you read this, you're going to find out that he didn't get to hear the rest of the story nor have the opportunity to believe it. So by that same token, are we able to believe that the biblical command to believe in Jesus Christ simply it should be done away with simply because of a hypothetical or a theoretical scenario. Now, you can just go on and on and on. What about, what about my being faithful to my wife? What about that? I mean, am I supposed to be faithful to my wife? Or if I'm on my way, I mean, on my way to tell my wife that I want to, we can just go on and on and on about all these things that really do not make any sense at all. Okay, how about repentance? If I'm right before I'm going to repent, uh, I mean, uh, we just go on and on with this scenario and it just doesn't hold water. We can do that. Of course, God wants all people to be saved. Let's get to the nitty gritty today. The Bible says, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now notice what the Word of God says. Because some people say, well, now wait a minute. And the person in the phone call would assume this and make this statement. He'd say, well, if you believe that, then God has to be some kind of monster in the sky. Why would God have to be a monster in the sky? If God says, this is what you have to do, and, and you know, I'm going to hold you accountable if you don't do it, then all of a sudden you don't do it, and you think God ought to relinquish everything He says because of your will and your purpose. You know, Watch this you know, carefully. We continue to, to uh, study some scripture here. On this, if I can get it to come up, come on now. Watch this. Ezekiel 33 and verse 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure. Now watch. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, or why will you die, O house of Israel? Now I want you to notice God speaking here. He says, Ezekiel, you tell them this. Some people there are probably arguing, God, that just isn't fair. You know, I've told you before, all these different scenarios I've heard, you know, people bring up all these different ideas. Why are you preaching about this today? Because I've been hit with it several times in the, the recent past. And, uh, you know, someone making that same argument I've told you about for years and years and years, talking about the sand dune theology. Well, what if we're out there in the desert someplace and somebody wants to be obedient to Jesus? You know, what are you going to do then? And I, uh, as though, you know, that just, that nullifies because you can bring up a scenario you think in your mind that gets us away from being obedient to God. So what do you do in that scenario? And I've told you for years, I'd take him right over that next sand dune and baptize him in that oasis. Somebody says, where'd you get that oasis? Same place you got the sand dune in your mind. Somebody asked me one time in a debate, said, said, well, Mr. Smith, I'd like for you to answer this question. You're up in an airplane. You've heard me talk about this, too. You're up in an airplane, and all of a sudden the airplane's going to crash. And, and I tell you what, you, you, you jump out of the airplane with a non-believer. Boy, stress that in the debate. Non-believer. And you're going to the ground. That non-believer wants to become a child of God. What are you going to do then, Mr. Smith? I'm going to baptize him. We go through that thundercloud. Because it has deep water in it, about six or eight feet from what I can see from right here. Where'd you get that thundercloud? Same place you got that airplane in your mind. You know, it's a very, you know, God wouldn't do that. And all these, we can come up with all kinds of scenarios. And I want to try to prove that to you today. That doesn't prove anything. First Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Watch, who desires all people to be, what's the word, church? saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now let's break this down a little bit. This is Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing to a preacher. 
Now, here's what's interesting in all of this. Notice what Paul says about God's desire for all to be saved. Salvation can't be severed from the truth. Paul says, Timothy, my desire, God's desire, is for all men to be saved. And I want to tell you this right now. They're going to have to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, what's sad to say, and I'm going to push us towards that eventful conclusion, is that people today are trying to go beyond what scriptures teach, 2 John and verse 9, which you shouldn't. They're getting away from that which was at one time delivered, Jude 3, and entrusted to the saints. They're trying to add to or take away, Revelation 22, 18, 19, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. You cannot sever salvation from the truth. What does that mean? Well, that means that when the Word of God says something is needed in order to be saved, that established truth cannot be changed by human situations. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what scenario you bring up. When God's truth is the truth, you can't change it. Now, I know a lot of people want to. There are people out here that write their own Bibles, write their own material, that will tell you that the Bible is totally inspired as long as it's rightly translated. You know what that means? That means they're going to tell you what they like and what they don't like about it. And so they incorporate their own writing, and when they do that, then we have a problem. Now, I want to make a, a, a point here. Paul was very pointed with the church at Ephesus, and that is a, a picture of one of the uh, ruins of Ephesus, what they believed Ephesus, where it was. But uh, I want you to watch this, what Paul would say in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It's familiar reading. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now I want you to notice, I want to make an example here. I want you to notice what Paul said, and here is one man's opinion. Now whenever I give this to you, I know there are some that, you know, I had one person come, that came to me uh, one time preaching, and they said, I don't like it whenever we mention other beliefs by name, and uh, the Bible never does that. To which I kind of laughed. I kind of thought, well, I, I, I've never read about a Pharisee or Sadducee or Jew or a New Covenant or anything. And, well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about never mentioning anybody by name. What? Can you not read Scripture? I didn't say that. that's what I wanted to say. How about this? Ananias and Sapphira kind of pointed out, don't you think? How about this one? Simon. Simon being a member of the Lord's church. How about this one? 1 Timothy 1, about verse 20. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I want you to hand Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan so they'll learn not to blaspheme. 2 Timothy. He tells Timothy again. And he mentions Hymenaeus' name, then he adds Philetus' name. These people are wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 4, about verse 10. He talks, he mentions Demas by name, a member of the church. He says, he's walked away. For the love of this world, he has deserted us. The implication is, walked away from the truth. In the first century, they didn't have any problem at all saying, you are wrong, your belief's wrong, you are wrong, mister, you are wrong, missus. And this is for the betterment of you. And I didn't do it in an ugly way. And someone would say, well, boy, you don't hear all of this calling you know, different denominations and all of that. You know why? Because none existed in the first century. That's why. You're going to tell me that the Apostle Paul was such a coward? That during the first century, if, if some belief was wrong, Paul wouldn't have stood up and said something, or Peter, the rest of the apostles. And certainly Jesus never confronted scriptural error, did he? So whenever I say that, and whenever I do this, uh, please understand, it's not out of animosity, it's not to embarrass, it is not to make fun of, it is to articulate from them, with precision, what is believed. Okay? And I do that out of love because I want to make sure I'm not misleading anyone. Thus, we have 
Edward Hiscox, who wrote the Standard Manual for Baptist Churches, not picking on Baptists, I'm just making a point here. In it, he makes this startling statement. Now, I want you to notice what we just read from Paul. One Lord, one faith. He says, it is most likely that in the apostolic age, that means when the apostles were here on this earth, when there was, when there was, no longer is, when there was, watch, but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and no differing denominations existed, the baptism of a convert by the very act constituted him a member of the church. Now he is saying that, uh, well, I believe that in the apostolic age, and this is way back in 1903, and people say, they don't believe that anymore. Yes, they do believe that. But uh, the documented there, if you want to check it out for yourself, they say, uh, the reason they say this is because that's what we practice that's what was being done in the New Testament. But now all of a sudden, somebody's going to vote on you as to whether or not you're worthy enough to be a member of that congregation before they baptize you. And I've told you before that it is a dangerous doctrine because of the faith issue that you're saved by faith only and you're saved whenever you believe, but then after you are believed and you have that faith and then we're going to vote on you to see whether or not it's all right to baptize you. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation according to them. I deny that. And if you have a belief that says you're saved before you're baptized, but you have to be baptized in order to be a member of that congregation, then you have to admit it takes more to be a member of your congregation than it does to go to heaven. Then you've got a problem. And that's the reason I'm mentioning this. Brother Jack, you sound angry. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate about what I believe. The point is, he is stating that he agrees with exactly what we teach took place in the beginning when the church was established. He couldn't have made our, our point any stronger than, than he did. The difference is that we still, te is di is that we still teach uh, this happened in the first century while he and his followers believe when denominations came about, their very existence caused a change in God's plan. If not, why not? And I disagree with that. My question is a simple one. Is there still one Lord, one faith, and one baptism? Or did the Holy Spirit get that wrong? That's not being facetious. That's not being belligerent. I'm just asking a very strong statement. I've never read in Scripture where anyone has a right to mess with the Word of God. Never read it. And the beautiful thing about this is Jude 3 says that it is the, the word of God or the truth has been given to us once and for all. Once and for all. Now church, hold on to that. We need to contend for the faith, that one faith, which has been given to us, watch, once and for all. That means, if that list of sevens that Paul spoke in Ephesians 4, 4 through 7, was valuable and relevant and truthful in the first century, it is also today. If not, why not? It, this is important because today there are many faiths and baptisms that are being taught, that, and people say, well, God accepts this. Then there would be also, of necessity, many lords. If I can go to Ephesians chapter 4, as the man did before, and say, back at that time when there was one Lord and one faith, and denomination didn't exist, yeah, baptism was like that, but now that we have many denominations, how do you suppose different beliefs came about, church? Put on the cognitive ability today, not that you don't always, that's not a condescending remark, but let's all of us put on, you know, the, the idea to have this, with this cognitive ability to discern, to research, to, to figure out what's going on. How did, two be, how did one become two? How did two become three and, and three become a thousand? How does all this happen? Because somehow, some way, one has become two in somebody's mind. And if you have someone teaching, baptism's not important. If you have someone teaching baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation, and somebody teaching baptism is only an outward expression of an inward already conviction, 
And somebody else saying water baptism doesn't exist, but it's Holy Spirit baptism. Somebody else teaching it's Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism. Somebody else teaching, all these are true now, that people teach that baptisms only in the Word has nothing to do with the water. Which one's right? Are they all wrong? Word of God still true. One baptism. One. Well, we go into that all we wanted to. And, you know, we could, I'll get, I'll get back to the major premise of my question in just a second. When Paul was baptized, Ananias told him he had a choice. Now, here was the idea of the choice that he had. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. I, I believe Paul could have walked away just like Christ could have walked away from being crucified to see the righteous one and to hear the voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness to him, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Of course, God knew what the outcome was going to be. Verse 16, and now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Paul's choice was either wait or not wait. Now here's interesting. Like everyone today, Paul had a choice to make about eternity. Whose fault is it? Let me ask this question. Whose fault is it, church, if a person chooses for one day or a hundred years to never obey God's commands? Whose fault is that? Is that God's fault? Is it my fault? Or is it the person's fault? See, we get all up in the air about all these things. Say, well, boy, I talk about this and talk about that. Many who believe in something known as deathbed repentance like to use, uh, is a, per, uh, like to use a thief on the cross. And let me just read that quickly before we go to something else. But when they use the thief on the cross, I've got this in three stages it looks like. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now they're making fun, both thieves are in the beginning. Then all of a sudden we see in verse 40, the other thief and the other rebuked him saying, one thief rebuking the other thief, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. That's a thief on the cross. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, this is Jesus speaking to the thief, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I want to, um, before we go on, I may hit this again. I, if you were here Wednesday night, I gave a, a long lesson on this. Let me just, just hit the highlights of that real, real briefly. It was an impossibility. You know, people say, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. I mean, you know, he's on his road toward eternity, and he decided and all of this. How do you handle that? Well, I'll get to the idea of a, the other covenant but, uh, in just a second. But let it be said that it was an impossibility. Do you think the thief could be saved without faith, without New Testament gospel-believing faith? Well, no. Do you think anyone can be saved without being obedient to the will and purpose of God? The truth of the matter, the thief on the cross, it was impossible for the thief on the cross to even commit to New Testament baptism that we have to commit to because Jesus hasn't died yet and His will hasn't come into effect. Matter of fact, it would be impossible for the thief on the cross to have faith in the gospel. And the faith we are required to live by today, we walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We're justified by faith, Romans 5 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, listen to it now. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now church, listen to me. The thief on the cross, it'd be impossible for him to have the faith we're commanded to have because Jesus hadn't died, wasn't buried, wasn't resurrected. So how could he have the same faith we're called upon to have today? So the truth of the matter is, hanging there, suspended between heaven and earth. I heard one denominational preacher say to me, there wasn't, I mentioned this this past Wednesday, there wasn't any water within 10 miles of the cross. You're bad wrong. 
They're crucified right outside of Jerusalem. I want to say all those people in Jerusalem had water. Jordan River wasn't 10 miles away. I mean, come on. You know it and I know it and everybody knows it. But anyway, there you go. First off, that statement isn't true. I just said that. Second, the thief may have well been baptized with John's baptism. We simply don't know one way or the other. Matthew 3, 5 through 6, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. I can't go to the thief on the cross and prove to you one way or the other where he was baptized in John's baptism or not. But I know one thing that's very much true. Jesus had the power to do what Jesus wanted to. The Bible is filled with commands, instructions, and requirements not intended to be duplicated by us. Let me give you an example of that. None of us in here believes we're supposed to sacrifice our kids like Abraham tried. None of us are supposed to build a boat like Noah. We are forbid we're not forbidden to eat certain fruit. We know that unless we are a thief that is hanging on a cross next to Jesus back in the first century, this has nothing to do with any of us whatsoever. That was between Jesus and the thief on the cross. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked to you about Naaman and how Naaman had leprosy and he's told to go dip in the Jordan River for you know, seven times and he threw a fit. He didn't like it. He said, I don't like your doctrine. This is what I think. And the answer was, well, uh, you can think what you want to think. You have that privilege. But if you want to be cleansed of leprosy, you're going to do it God's way. So he goes and dips in the river Jordan seven times. He comes up and his flesh is clean. White as any white could possibly be. And Luke 4 and verse 27 tells us, I go to that a lot, tells us that he was the only one, the only leper that was cleansed in that fashion. Why is that? The same thing is with the thief on the cross because that was between God and the leper just like the thief on the cross was between Jesus Christ and the leper. But what happened on that cross doesn't nullify any of the commands we have in the new covenant. And of course, both Jesus and the thief were under the law of Moses as the church wasn't established yet and wouldn't be for some time. Let's look at this briefly and then we're going to um, wind this up before long. I think. Yes. Therefore, the Word of God says in Hebrews 9, 15 and 17, Therefore He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, for there where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established for a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. It is true, and I'm not going to take time to go over all of this. It is true that Jesus died on the cross before the thieves died on their cross. But the will didn't come into effect until the church was established in Acts chapter 2. And there's scripture evidence for that. I won't go over this morning. Now the point of this is... Since the church was established, we've been told to obey the law of Christ. Now, this is what's important to us. I can bring up all kinds of scenarios. I have my own personal feeling about, you know, what if someone's on their way to, to being baptized and something happens to them, you know? Uh, well, uh, number one, unless that happens, I don't know of a case where that's happened. I don't personally know. You may. I don't. You know, that's totally in God's hands, but still yet even having say, say, uh, said that. Unless that is in our situation, what's that have to do with us anyway? It doesn't nullify anything. A hypothetical doesn't nullify anything. I remember Vicki telling me about the night that she was baptized and how out at Jerusalem at that time, they didn't have a baptistry. And she and her brother, or maybe if they did, it wasn't functioning. And she and her brother had to go all the way into Moralton to be baptized. And there was a big storm brewing. I mean, it was a, what she was telling, a bad storm. And her brother had come forward to be baptized. And I, I think Vicki on the way decided she wanted to be baptized too. And it was only natural to look up into the, to the clouds and to the sky and think, Lord, just let me make it there. Let me make it there. You know, that's, that's not doubt. That's love for a soul. That's love for wanting to be right with Almighty God. 
Church, I'm just telling you today that all the hypotheticals and the scenarios that people want to bring up does not change the will and purpose of God. You're never going to change Acts 2.38. You're never going to change 1 Peter 3.21. Acts 2 and verse 38 says we need to repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. 1 Peter 3.21 says the like figure uh, whereunto baptism doth also now save us. I didn't write that. Somebody else did. Now watch this. 1 Corinthians 9.21. We're going to close. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Now, Brother Jack, why is this scripture up there? Well, very importantly, <clears throat> because we have those that say, we're not under law today, we're under grace. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We are under grace. We're under the law of Christ. Now, some people want to say that we're not under law today as though there isn't anything that God requires of us. But when, just keep this in mind. When the Word of God states a command, there isn't any hypothetical or theoretical or example that we can give that will nullify the command of Almighty God. That's what's gotten people in trouble over the centuries and will continue to get people into trouble. So here's the bottom line. I believe Scripture absolutely teaches that it's absolutely necessary for someone to be baptized into Christ for the right reason. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? If you can be baptized right, you can be baptized wrong. If you can worship right, you can worship wrong. Everybody follow what I'm saying? In Acts chapter 19, there were 12 people that had received the baptism of John and they're told they need to be baptized again because that baptism wasn't right. Boy, a baptism was right. It just wasn't what was needed during the, the uh, Christian era. And so they're baptized again. And the problem was they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And there's a, a we go all into that idea. And the point being that uh, Scripture teaches what needs to be done. We are told that we need to hear. We need to believe. We need to repent. We need to confess. We need to be baptized into Christ. Listen, for the remission of our sins. We were raised up, walk in newness of life, and that newness of life has to represent itself in the way we live and conduct ourselves. The only way we have to prove to God that we're serious about our religion, serious about our Christianity, is by the way we live. That's it. If you've never been baptized into Christ, you need to repent, whatever it is. Won't you come as we stand and sing?